Over 53 starters getting lined up, heating up their tires, trying to get ready for a start to the world's richest dirt track race. I'm Steve Evans with Brock Gates and Ed Bruce. A little earlier, Brock and I had a chance to take a look at one of the better modified cars you'll find in this field. You know, Brock, I take a look at the number 20 modified car, Brad Hearn, here, and I wouldn't mind going for a ride in one of these. I mean, you got the Nerf bars on both sides, big bumpers fore and aft. You got a super roll cage on a two by four square tubing frame. I mean, these things are kind of bulletproof. Oh, they're real bulletproof. You know, they'll run them four or five times a week. So they got a big block Chevy in here, 467 inches, four barrel carburetor, about 700 horsepower, but really, really reliable. You know, when we first saw these cars a number of years ago, they looked like an old American Motors gremlin. In fact, they, they could, they were. That's right. Now they've really gotten the bodies uh, down very tightly regulated in terms of height and width. Uh, but inside there is really basically a, a sprint car frame. You know, and Brett and the guys have been paying some attention to aerodynamics. Maybe one of the reasons are a good deal quicker even than they were a year ago when we saw them. How about those tires? You know, they really regulated those, too. Well, that keeps it a driver's series, I think. You can't run a tire uh, any wider than 13 inches, any more than 92 inches around. Yeah. So everyone's essentially on the same tire. you got a NASCAR-style fuel cell, so a uh, fire's not going to be a problem. What do you think? Uh, we could buy one of these for 40 grand. How about a new Mercedes? <laughs> you got a deal. Okay. A dirt Mercedes. Well, that'd be a good class, wouldn't it? <laughs> I don't see any out here right now, Steve. As they come down through turn three, notice again how narrow that place is. I think they're going to get a green. They are indeed, and all eyes are on the front runners. Barefoot Bob McCready and Sammy Swindell. Swindell, in many ways, is an alien to these fans. They like Barefoot Bob, Brock. So far, clean start, Steve. There is Glenn Fitzgerald. He's slipped past Jack Johnson into the sixth spot. Don't forget, Glenn is the quickest guy in a place in qualifying. And amazingly enough, for the second year in a row, 53 cars have snaked their way through. That narrow turn number two, no contact made. That says a lot for the overall quality of these drivers, Brock. Very cautious right now in the opening stages of this race. Don't forget. 50,000 bucks up for the winner, so everybody's going to try to keep their equipment together. Not too aggressive right now. Amazingly, though, all those guys managed to get down that back straightaway without a caution or somebody getting into the fence. That's happened before on the starts here at Syracuse. It's been pretty hairy, but right now the track is green, and barefoot Bob McCready is moving up on Sammy Swindell, Steve. Barefoot Bob is right on the rear nerf bar of number 11, Sammy Swindell. Swindell, two-time World of Outlaws Sprint Car Champion, out in front of the richest dirt track race in the world. Imagine he would win more here today than he's ever won in a sprint car, Brock. Could be interesting uh, to see a newcomer come in here. It's never been done before. This is a very close little fraternity here in the Northeast of the United States. And you can be sure that there'd be a bunch of sore guys if Sammy took all that money back to Tennessee with him. Well, the big equalizer here is the Moody Mile itself. At this distance, a Swindell can run with any of these drivers. They're all used to coming off the short tracks. This gives them that common denominator. Notice that Sammy is tucking that car right up in against the inside fence using a very low line as he comes down the lawn straightaway, as we said, maybe touching 150 miles an hour before he lets off the throttle and just slides that modified through turn number one. And here's the beautiful orange car, number 58 of Mike McLaughlin. He's in the third spot, but coming up on him fast is New Jersey's Jimmy Horton car, number 85. Down the back straightaway they go. Here comes your leader, Sammy Swindell. Looks like he's moved out a little bit on barefoot Bob McCready, maybe about four car lengths as they come off the fourth turn and head down the main straightaway. So Sammy right now, Steve Evans, seems to be maintaining a pretty comfortable lead. Well, Sammy's out there cruising right now, Brock, but it's going to get interesting in a couple of laps because they're going to get into traffic. And we have seen in the past how well Swindell can handle traffic in a sprinter. Can he do the same thing in a not-quite-so-familiar modified car? Steve, remember that number 20? That's the one you wanted to buy and go racing in. Right now, Brett Hearn, one of the real young stars in this business, is in the cockpit out of Kenilon, New Jersey. Brett really had a bad qualifying time. The car just didn't get hooked up. Started way back in 31st spot, but told me just before he got into the car that he felt they had the chassis sorted out and to watch him. Well, right now, he's moved up about six spots and maybe up among the leaders before the day's out. Who's to know? Sammy Swindell in the lead, getting some pressure now from Bob McCready. McCready has moved up steadily and is right now coming down that front straightaway. Maybe going to make a move on Swindell. Let's see. Bearded, barefoot, Bob McCready. Well, 
Bob's got that uh, odd uh, grill we talked about on his car, and I don't know whether it's helping right now or not, but he got a little bit wobbly there coming off a of turn two. Notice and fell back a little bit. So Sammy right now appears to be able to hold off McCready, but uh, McCready has a lot of confidence, an awful lot of experience here at Syracuse, and uh, could very well be a factor. Don't forget, too, that this race is going to start to break up, especially in the groove in turn one and turn three. That's a standard practice of this old racetrack, and that can get bumpy, and that can cause some problems. And how about Brad Hernbrock? You were talking about him earlier, car number 20. Well, he's now moved up to the 21st position. Oh, he is on a roll right now, Steve. Here he comes in that yellow 20 on the outside of turn one. There it just uh, hooks it back into line. Good job. Brad Hearn, we'll see more of him today, I'm sure. And a huge roar from the grandstands is down the front straightaway. Barefoot Bob McCready alongside Swindell now in front of him. That is McCready taking the lead from Sammy Swindell going into turn number two now. A very decisive pass got down underneath him and uh, into turn one. And look at this. McCready has moved way out now. Uh, Sammy either is slowing down Steve or else is just backing it off and letting somebody else leave for a while. But right now McLaughlin and Jimmy Horton are moving into challenge as well. McLaughlin and that bright orange Jack Johnson built automobile and he's getting a lot of pressure from the car just behind him number 85 Jimmy Horton Horton getting sideways trying to take that third spot away from Mike McLaughlin the car just in front of McLaughlin well that is Swindell who has lost a lot of ground to barefoot Bob McCready there you can see Horton in the blue and white car try to squeeze underneath McLaughlin coming off of turn two can't make it stick Mike holds on to third down that narrow back straightaway in the front though Sammy Swindell trailing barefoot Bob McCready and look at this there goes Horton you can see him lifting that inside left front wheel because he cranks that car through turn four and it's going to get even busier because just ahead of Sammy Swindell car number 11 is number 33 Jack Cottrell that would be the first traffic car that Swindell has encountered the first car he will try to put a lap down. Well, Steve, so far it's been a super clean race. Usually we have a yellow here pretty early in the going in Syracuse, but right now, no problems at all as Sammy tries to get underneath control and right on his tail is McLaughlin and Horton. Swindell comes up and bumps the back of Cottrell. Now McLaughlin bumps Swindell. McLaughlin is forced high. Swindell gets sideways. And look at this. The ultimate winner in all of that action was Jimmy Horton, who has now gone into the second spot at number 85. And is moving out, Steve. He's got a big, big opening. Look at this. Sammy Swindell got real wide going into turn number one. I wonder if he's got some problems. Well, Brock, I wouldn't be surprised if it was contact four and a half on Swindell's car. Swindell has got tire problems. Swindell has shredded a tire and is falling back rapidly. It's all he can do to just keep the car going straight ahead. Right, Steve. And Bob Fisher, who started way back in the pack, is smoking badly. Those two cars, this one, that's Sammy Swindell and Fisher's have brought out the caution here at Syracuse as we see Swindell just struggle into the pits with that tire just torn to shreds. That is going to take him out of contention for a while. But, of course, we got a long way to go at Syracuse and a whole bunch of pit stops coming up by the leaders. So this may or may not be a disaster for Sammy. The question is, though, Steve, can he go the distance on a full tank of fuel after having stopped this early? Well, Brock, when he gets out there, he's going to have to run so hard to make up for this time loss to the pits. I don't think so. I think Swindell will have to stop at least one more time. Right now, Sammy just wishing he could get back out onto the racetrack. We're under caution here at Syracuse. Stick with us. The green flag should be coming up. The pole winner, Sammy Swindell, number 11. He got a fresh right rear tire, went out on the track under caution, didn't like it, and is back in the pits again. And Brock Yates, they've finally got him moving, but boy, he's lost a lot of positions. He sure has. That's a tough break for Sammy. Also, we've lost some other competitors. Scott Tobias, the number 17 car, is out, and this man, Bobby Allison, is going to park it. As you can see there, he started way at the back, the second to the last man in this field. The car has not behaved well all week during qualifying and practice, and Bobby just had to park it. That was the end of it. A tough break. Meanwhile, Steve has made his way to the Sammy Swindell pit. I'm with Billy Taylor, the crew chief of car number 11. First of all, Sammy shredded a tire, right? Right. Uh, he got hit in the left rear by uh, Jimmy Horton and uh, took cut the tire down. Then when he left the pits, it sounded like he couldn't find low gear. Uh, what it was is uh, if they ride the clutch uh, between a sprint car driver and a dirt driver, they uh, take the clutches out. 
window. And then when he left it at the second time, it sounded like the clutch may have really suffered some damage. Yeah, it's gone. Uh, we, what we're going to do is, uh, on restarts, we're going to have to shut it off and uh, push him off. That's all. It's direct drive like a button in a Subaru. Same thing. Thank you, Billy. OK, thank you. So Sammy Swindell faces a little extra challenge here at Syracuse, but he's not the only man. This is car number 58, Mike McLaughlin. Remember, he was in that tango with Sammy and Jimmy Horton, and he has suspension problems. Steve, he started in the third spot here at Syracuse and had high hopes. Well, this is his second trip into the pit area, Brock, to try to get the right front sorted out. Uh, and you're right, he did suffer some damage in uh, that little uh, tangle with Sammy Swindell. And with the yellow flag still out, let's check in with our buddy Ed Bruce. Ed? We're in the control tower at the New York State Fairgrounds, the Moody Mile, and I'm standing here with Glenn Donnelly, who's the president of DIRT. First, real quick, Glenn, what does DIRT stand for? Drivers Independent Race Tracks. Okay. Now, walking around the track here today, we see a lot of uh, license tags from New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, whatever. Seems to be a, a regional, a lot of regional support, even neighborhood support for the drivers. Uh, how do you explain this, this support like this? Well, a lot of our tracks are situated all over the Northeast here, and the modifieds that you see running here today are, are cars that are made up of, you know, Northeast modifieds. It's about 42 racetracks, and all these different tracks are situated, again, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, yeah. you know, Northeast here, and they all want to see their hometown boys do well. So these same fans will follow their favorite drivers around from track to track? Oh, yeah, they follow them. You know, it, it's been a real ongoing thing, and, of course, this is like our World Series. You know, it culminates the whole summer of our activities. Well, this is the ultimate dirt track race. Hey, thanks for talking to us, and we got a good day for racing. Let's go back to some more of it. Okay. Thanks, Ed. They're still under caution here at Syracuse as we watch Bob McCready lead it, but interesting Jack Johnson in that 12A, that orange car that we saw win here last year, Steve, has moved into second spot. But the guy who's been the most fun to watch, Brad Hearn. Look at that. Car number 20 has moved up from 31st to 10th. And Brock, as they idle down into turn number four, they are getting on the gas. Coming out of three, into four, we are green flag again. Here they come. Barefoot Bob McCready in that white and yellow car holds the lead up from Jack Johnson as they hit down into turn number one, Steve. Johnson tries to go down low, finds no room there, just falls back in line with Bob McCready. The smart thing to do, going to turn number two and head it out onto the back stretch. Barefoot Bob McCready stretching it out a little bit. Right you are, coming at you down the narrow back straightaway. McCready right behind him. Johnson and Jimmy Horton riding in the third spot. He's been up among the leaders all day long. Well, a big advantage for Bob McCready all season long, they tell me up here, Brock, his car has handled better than anybody else's. Maybe he hasn't had the horsepower, and maybe it's that bodywork that contributes to it. But he's right now leading it. And so far, a good, clean restart. We've had some good, good racing so far. Not a lot of trouble. There goes Brett Hearn trying to get by Colville. Picking up another spot if possible, but look at that. He's nudged to the outside and falls back. Brett Hearn in that number 20 car. He bumped against C.D. Colville in the ninth spot and falls back. And Jeff Hetzler in that J-17 moves up to take that place. So that little gamble pushes Hearn back to the 11th spot. But Steve, number 12, the white number 12 of Carl Collis is on the move. He's in 12th spot. And remember, he started in 35th place. And here goes Brett Hearn, passing the black car of Jeff Hotesville. Yes, as they go down to turn number one, Brett Hearn retakes 10th position. So, Steve, now we've got Hearn and Collis beginning to breathe on the leaders. They come from way, way back in the pack. Oh, problem in turn two, Rock. Problem in turn number two. There is just a mammoth pileup. And for sure, this is going to bring out the yellow, if not the red. No, nope, just the yellow flag coming out. We got one upside down. That would appear to be number 64, Ken Johnson. And he's crawling out. He's OK. Well, we said that's the trouble spot on this racetrack. Turn number two, a big jam up. He's OK, Ken Johnson, but the yellow's out. The crew of number 58, Mike McLaughlin, talking to him on the radio. And apparently, Brock Yates, Mike McLaughlin is going to stay out there because we may not be that far away from the green flag. He could get caught in here. Well, he's still got suspension problems. They're concerned about that car. Remember, uh, Mike was in that tangle with uh, Sammy Swindell earlier in the go, and uh, that has 
taken really taken him out of contention. Started up in third spot and just has fallen back because of that chassis problem. Well, this is the final lap under caution. They've displayed the white flag, which means the green flag will come out. And in modified dirt cars, they usually start racing about turn number three. That'll wait till the start finish line. Bob McCready will be leading it. Jack Johnson just behind him. Jimmy Horton, who's driven a strong, consistent race. Glenn Fitzcharles has not moved up like he would have liked to. Brad Hearn is still holding on to 10. A big improvement over a 31st starting position. Well, Steve, don't forget, Glenn Fitzgerald was the quickest qualifier in this field, broke the track record. He's up among the leaders, and he may be just kind of biding his time back there, uh, waiting for this uh, traffic to clear a little bit. And speaking of traffic, we're going to have a jam up. That's turn three. They're on the throttle. They're heading for the green flag and a restart. And again, it's Bob McCready, the yellow and white car. That is number nine. Just ahead of Jack Johnson. Johnson moves to the outside. Let's go. Johnson cannot take a work going to the turn number one, and he tucks in wisely. So. Well, that's really a one group corner, as you can see. A couple of guys try it hot, but it won't work. They've got to tuck down against the fence and just sail through their single file, as they basically do down this very narrow back straightaway. So it's McCready, Johnson, and Jimmy Horton in that blue and white car in third place. And Steve, he started fifth and has been among the leaders all day long. He could be a factor. Oh, absolutely. Jimmy Horton, tremendous experience here at Syracuse. And uh, as you said before, he may just kind of be in the catbird seat there waiting for an opportunity. Yeah, he and Glenn Fitzgerald's right behind him. And there is Brent Hurd, still charging, still pushing his way through the leaders. Now, Hurd has moved up to ninth. Just in front of him is C.D. Coville in the eighth spot, and Hurd wants him. He sure does. Down the back straight away. Not much chance to get by there. Tries the inside line. Yes, he makes it stick on a very difficult part of this racetrack. He gets by C.D. Colville going into turn three. So Brad Hearn is now in the eighth position to get seven. He'll have to get around number 115. Kenny Tremont. So slowly picking his way through this field. He obviously is the quickest guy on the racetrack right now. But don't forget, right behind him is Carl Collis, who's also moving up. So we've got Collis in 12, Brett Hearn in that yellow number 20, kind of the factors in this event. Everybody's watching them. Well, Brock, a lot of smoke in the back straightaway. Uh, I believe we have got a blown engine. Yes, smoking badly coming by us is number one, Joe Plazek. And that is one big block Chevrolet that is not going to live to race any longer today. And you can see the oil going down. And on this kind of the racetrack, there's really no dirt to absorb that oil. The yellow flag comes out. Right, Steve. The Syracuse Mile is so hard packed that it is really like asphalt more than dirt. And of course, Plazek's motor blew right in turn number two, and we know how dangerous that is. Probably the most difficult part of this racetrack. And the last thing these guys need is a patch of oil to run through. So Joe Plazek coast into the pits with a very expensive motor job facing him and his crew. He's finished for the day. Well, the field forming up, of course, on the point is Bob McCready. But I'll tell you who deserves a mention, number 82, Rick Jeffrey. He started 10th. He's moved up to 4th. A good, solid drive. Not spectacular, but getting the job done. And, of course, Brett Hearn, number 20, he's up to 8th from 31st. Maybe the biggest story of the day so far. Right, Steve, and the green is out. They're on the gas as they sweep off turn number four here at Syracuse. McCready leads it right behind him. Jack Johnson trying to get by the same three cars. McCready, Johnson, and uh, Horton have held out all afternoon among the leaders. And every time they head down into turn number one, Johnson goes high, takes a peek, tucks back in. These cars are so evenly matched. When the fans come to Syracuse, they know there's no such thing as a runaway here. How about Kenny Tremont, Rock? He has moved all the way up into fifth, car number 115. He has been on the move, and of course, that number 20 car is Brent Hearn. He's sitting back there in seventh place, about to challenge Billy Pouch for sixth. And what wins this kind of race, Brock, is obviously the talent of the driver we talked about, but also the crew, the right tire, the right suspension setting. Well, absolutely, Steve. They very strictly govern the uh, bodywork rules here. Gary Ballou came in here at Syracuse about four years ago with a radical ground effects car and just blew everybody away. Since then, Glenn Donnelly in the dirt uh, sanctioning body said no more tricks. These cars are almost identical in terms of their bodywork. Some uh, aerodynamics on it, but for the most part, it's pure horsepower, driving skill, and tires that makes the difference. And Brett Hearn, car number 20, trying to mow another one down, trying to take the sixth position. He is going to do it. He gets around Billy Pouch, car number five. Pouch slides high, saying, where did this guy come from? Wow, what a surprise that he just blew past Billy Pouch with a very, very 
hard competitor and uh, doesn't give way all that easily. But uh, Ron Hearns just kind of elbowed his way underneath him. And now he moves in on Kenny Tremont in that white and blue number 115 car. So, Brett Hearn, you can be sure at every stopwatch along pit row in the hands of the crew chiefs is on this man in that yellow number 20. He is the man of the hour right now, just sawing his way through this field. But the farther up he moves, the tougher they get to pass such as Kenny Tremont here from West Sand Lake, New York, in a car owned by his father. Kenny has moved up from 14th uh, all the way to 5th, so not too bad either. It sure isn't. As we watch uh, Kenny Tremont uh, pull out a little bit on uh, Hearn, notice Hearn just tucks that race car right up against the fence as he gets into turn number three. Sweeps wide off of turn four and uses that big, long front straightaway to build up a lot of speed because that is the only good place to pass here. Well, Kenny Tremont may have hauled in the progress of Brett. We got big problems in turn four. That is their car against the wall of John Birock. Sammy Swindell has hit him, car number 11, who led this race earlier on. And, oh, Buzzy Rudiman has just rammed the parked car of Sammy Swindell. An awful collision in turn four. Well, Sammy Swindell was just sitting there parked, and the veteran Buzzy Rudiman came off turn four, building up speed. We're going to have a yellow here. We've got a bad crash. The racetrack is almost fully blocked. Sammy Swindell climbing out of his race car. Virash and Rudiman still inside their cars. Let's take another look at what happened here. Coming off turn four, we see Virash sliding toward the outside wall. There is Sammy Swindell who follows him up against the fence, squeezes him in there, bounces off Virash's car, and comes to a halt. A whole bunch of other cars seem to get by in pretty good shape, and then Buzzy Rudiman, Steve Evans, comes wide off turn four and tags the stop car of Sammy Swindell. An awful shot. I'd say he probably hit him at almost 100 miles an hour. And I'm sure that came as a complete surprise to Sammy Swindell. I would guess that Swindell was just about ready to unbuckle, Brock. Obviously, he didn't, or he wouldn't have walked away from that car. Well, it was a fortunate thing for Sammy and also a testimony to the fuel cells and the safety of these automobiles. No fire. Here is Jack Johnson sliding in for a stop. He is the defending champion here at Syracuse currently riding in second place taking advantage of what's going to be an extended yellow flag to change tires and add fuel and these are scheduled stops they hope to only make one in fact you're not going to win the Schaefer 200 if you make more than one pit stop taking on inside rubber is Jack Johnson fuel of course now it gets a little wild down in these pit areas Brock because these guys aren't all that used to doing this here is car number 20 Brad Hurt who lost this race in the pitch remember a year ago when a Jack got hung underneath the car Steve, I'm sure his crew is very, very much aware of that as they deliberately go about making this uh, crucial pit stop here. Fresh tires going on the rear, 22 gallons of fuel going on board as Brett Hearn takes a little bit of a drink from uh, while without removing his helmet. That's kind of a trick here as we watch the fuel can go over the pit wall. Soon the car will come down off that single hand jack and Brett Hearn pushed off and underway. So far, no problems. Good pit stop for Brett Hearn. So Brett Hearn heads back out onto the track. I'm a little surprised, Brock, that Bob McCready has not used this yellow to pit. No, he still continues to circulate out there in the lead. You would think maybe this would be an opportunity to make the stop. As we watch Jimmy Horton currently in third place come in, a crewman checks the chassis settings, make sure everything is still buttoned up tight. And it looks, Steve, as if they're not going to change the rear tires. There is not a jack man or a tire changer inside here, Brock. They're taking on fuel from those big dump cans, but no tires on Jimmy Horton's car. Interesting bit of strategy. Unfortunately, veteran Buzzy Rudiman has been taken to the hospital. We're not sure of his injuries. We'll keep you informed. In the meantime, Bob McCready continues to lead. He has not stopped. Now let's go to Steve and Jimmy Horton's pit. Bucky, I know you had a good stop, but obviously you didn't change tires. Now we feel we don't need to change the tires. They look good to us. We're gas and go. Game on with the rain, see how we make out. You know, some races this morning were concerned they might have, might even have to make two stops for tires because of the rain and the abrasiveness of the racetrack. We don't feel so. Gas and go. What's Jimmy saying about the track, about conditions generally? Should get faster if the rain stays away. Well, I hope it works for you. Let's go to Brock with Doug Olson, the number 20 crew chief. Sounds like things had a super pit stop. What's he saying, though, about the race car? Uh, it said the race car feels real good. We, pit, we picked up a little bit of a push right now, but we've uh, put some more air in the back tires. We should correct that. 
He's, the tires look just super coming off the car. The tires are excellent. We really didn't have to change them, but we wanted to go with more air pressure, so we're set now. Oh, yeah. You know, considering where you started uh, way back in 31st, are you happy with, with where you are right now? We're real happy. He says he's got a ton of horsepower. If he just can control that push a little bit, we'll be in real good shape. Stop's over. You're not going to come in again? I hope not. All right. Good deal. You're not going to, what I meant was, you're not going to try to correct that push. Uh, we tried to correct it with the two tires we just put on the back. Just got a little bit more stagger. Okay, so you're going to live with what you got now. And huh? four, Brent. Okay. Yes, we're going with it. Good deal. Thanks. Okay. For sure. Good job. So Doug Olson talking to his driver, Brett Hearn, and Brock Gates all at the same time. All right, just about everybody's got fresh tires right now, except for the one man who's gambling on that, Jimmy Horton. We got a restart. And the other man in the lead right now, Bob McCready, don't forget, he hasn't stopped at all. So opportunity slipped through his grasp as we watch McCready hold on. Look at this. Hearn down low once more, moving up into fifth spot, Steve. And Hearn didn't waste any time checking out that car after the pit stop. It is handling beautifully. Brett Hearn has got some race car underneath him now. And right now, Steve, Dave Lape in fourth place is in Hearn's sights. Uh, Dave, of course, a veteran of this kind of racing, moved all the way up from 21st starting spot, so he is on a roll as well. But right now, he's got his hands full with that car number 20 and young Brett Hearn. Even though Hearn has just charged through this field, here is where he likes the pass and has done it consistently. Right there, just going into turn number one. He is, does not get in a hurry on the back straight, doesn't take a chance in two, three, or four. Turn one, he executes. Well, you notice, Steve, what he does is he charges that corner and relies on the handling of that automobile to get him through the corner. A lot of guys have to let off a little earlier than uh, Brett does because they just don't have the cornering power to get through that corner. But Brett, the handling pays off so well, he just dives underneath everybody going down into turn one. So right now, into fourth place, Brett Hearn now challenging for the third spot. That's Rick Jeffrey in the number 82 car. He held off her in that time, but it'll be interesting to see, Steve, if he can make it stick the next time around because Hearn is so aggressive going down into turn one. Okay, let's watch Brad Hearn gathering in Rick Jeffrey, coming out of turn number three, headed into turn four. Now he'll try to slingshot his way past him down the main straightaway and make that pass on the inside of turn one. Here they come out of four. Jeffrey in his sights. If he can get around Jeffrey, he'll have the third spot. Remember, he started 31st. He can't do it. He'll have to wait another lap. Here is the race for the sixth spot. That is Carl Collins in the white car, number 12, blowing right by sprint car wizard Steve Kenzer. Oh, don't forget, Carl Collis started in 34th spot, has moved through this field, keeping pace with Brett Hearn. So these two guys are the quickest men on the racetrack right now. As we watch Brett Hearn again try Jeffries coming off at of turn four, it'll be the challenge into turn one once more, Steve. Boy, Hearn had the hammer down coming out of turn four. Smoke in that right rear tire. Here they are into turn number one, and no. Hearn again could not get around Jeffrey. Well, he just can't do it now into turn two. You just don't pass in turn two really uh, effectively, so he's going to have to just trail Jeffrey down the back straight. There you see him fall back a little bit into turn three as they move up on one of the slower automobiles. That is car 28, Steve Kinzer, the sprint car wizard, the World of Outlaw champion so many times, out of it here today as he follows his cohort from the World of Outlaws, Sammy Swindell, into the pits. But at least he still has a race car left. Swindell's car was a total. Look at this. Here is Jeffrey in the pit. Car number 82 coming in. You know what that does? It moves Brett Hearn up one more spot. Well, Steve, we've got a caution because of Kinzer's blown engine, which gives Rick the opportunity to make his stop. He didn't uh, come in when everybody else did during that rudiment crash. And you would think that Bob McCready would be in here on this yellow flag as well, Brock. You know, there is a bonus of like $2,000 for leading the midway point of this race. Maybe that's what McCready is thinking about, that two grand bonus. Well, it could be, Steve, but it may uh, be the only amount of money he takes home here because if he doesn't stop and get himself a yellow flag late in the race and has to come in out of green, it could be a disaster for him. And he's driven so well today, I sure hope it doesn't cost him the race. The clock continues to tick as Rick Jeffrey in the pits gets ready to go, but the field is coming off turn four, and unless he gets underway real quick, Steve, he's going to go a lap down. We have got a green flag out indeed. Rick Jeffrey is going to go a lap down. Just some bad timing. It took a little on the pit. You see Jeffrey slow on the inside there. Everybody trying to get safely around him, and they do. Out in front, Bob McCready, but how long can he stay there without pitting? 
Well, I'll tell you what, Steve, this is like drawing to an inside straight from McCready. He's got a gamble on a late race uh, yellow flag to save it all because, as you know, Hearn has stopped. He's got full fuel and fresh tires, and he is in a very commanding position right now, even though he's only in second place. And he got that second place spot with, again, a very aggressive restart. Now, McCready's been out there trying to pick up that $2,000 to come in just a few laps. Well, Brad Hearn could win it just as well now, Brock. Well, more than that, he could win himself about uh, 48000 extra with the overall prize money here because that is the real money that's at stake. As we watch McCready, though, still in command, the car is handling beautifully, and then notice that Firm doesn't seem to be charging quite as hard right now. He may uh, figure that McCready has to make that stop. Really, there's no sense in trying to run him down right now that he'll just sit back there in second. He's got a good race for third between the Johnson. That, of course, is Jack Johnson in the red number 12. And right in front of him, number 27, Danny Johnson from Clifton Springs, New York, who started well back in the field and through the uh, attrition and pit stops has done a good job and moved up among the leaders. Well, the main reason Danny Johnson has moved up so far, Brock, is he has not pitted yet, much like McCready. So he's bound to lose some spots when indeed that happens. Well, so far, though, he's holding off Jack Johnson, who, as you know, has won this race twice before and one of the really strong man on the Syracuse mile so whatever Danny Johnson doing a good job as we watch Jack Johnson move underneath and try to get by him down in through turn one the favorite passing spot here on the old mile and look at this Steve that's the leader Bob McCready reaching for his wallet because if he can get around the last two turns here he will pick up the two thousand dollars with a halfway mark left and that'll be a relief to the crew Brock who's been waiting and waiting for that car to come in once he gets the two grand Bob McCready has got to come into the pits. He'll hope to get a yellow flag. What if he doesn't? Well, he's got to get a yellow flag. If he doesn't, he's going to fall a lap down because these guys are getting around here in just about 32 seconds under race conditions, and you cannot put on fuel and change two tires with these race cars in that amount of time. Here comes the leader into the pit. He got the yellow flag he was looking for. Number nine, Bob McCready, his crew. A sigh of relief as they'll go to work on that car. You can bet it'll get tires. It'll get fuel. And Brock, we are just past the halfway point in this race. McCready knows he has got enough fuel to go the distance. What about some of the guys that pitted earlier? Brad Hearn, Jack Johnson, I wonder. Good question, Steve, as we watch Dave Lape. Remember, he was up among the leaders as well. He is also in the pit. So McCready and Lape gambled on a late caution flag, and it pays off for him. And as you say, some of the guys that stopped way, way early may be thinking, gee, maybe I should have held off a little bit too because the old gas gauge could be falling toward E near this, the end of this race. Well, I'll tell you what's going to be fun to watch when again we go to green. It's going to be that car, number nine. Bob McCready try to play catch up as we've seen Brett Hearn do all afternoon. Well, as McCready goes out to rejoin the field still in the yellow, let's rejoin Ed Bruce. This is the vice president of dirt, Andy Fusco. Andy, uh, we've heard uh, this referred to. Now, we didn't say it, you understand, but we've heard this referred to as the biggest kept secret in all of, all of motorsports. How do you explain this? Well, it's not really a secret here in the Northeast. It probably is, though, in the rest of the country yet because modifieds are an animal that are pretty much germane to the uh, to the, their stopping grounds here in the Northeast. And it's kind of a strange automobile in the rest of the country. But in the Northeast, modifieds are the top class in dirt track racing. There are over 1,700 of these cars in the Northeast running more than 40 tracks. And when we get going in June, July, and August, our drivers are running five or six nights a week. We run our special events on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And of course, they're going on the weekend shows and the bull rings every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night. How many people do you draw here this weekend? This week, there'll, there'll be over 88,000 people. That's the record that was set uh, last year, and it's certain to be beaten this year. Well, it's some great racing. Let's go back to it. Thank you, Andy. And thank you, Ed, as we watch the pace car head for the pits and the field heads down the back straightaway. They're going to get ready for a green. Brett Hearn leads it. Jack Johnson in second. And Steve, what more can you say about Carl Collis? Had to run in the consolation race even to get into this field. Started way back in 34th spot. Well, the guys who were first and second a year ago are now running second and third, that being Jack Johnson and Carl Collis. What a race we may have here with Brad Hearn out in front of Johnson. Two of the best and two of the most popular drivers of the fans. And, Steve, that is Carl Collis in the white 12 trying to squeeze underneath Rick Jeffrey. Remember, he was among the leaders, made a stop, and has now fallen back to 19th spot. We have just got so many stories going on here simultaneously. Of course, Collis, who's come up to the pack, Brad Hearn miraculously leads it. 
Jack Johnson capable of winning the race as he did a year ago. Rick Jeffrey, can he move up? And how about back there somewhere is Bob McCready. In fact, he is in the 15th spot. He'll be making a charge. He sure will. But right now, the man in command here is Brett Hearn. Jack Johnson both have moved out a little bit on the rest of the field. So it's Hearn and Johnson fighting it out. Interesting to see whether Hearn is going to back down a little bit, Steve, because he may have a fuel problem. You know, he stopped early, so did Jack Johnson. So these guys may try to break out from the field a little bit and then back off on the pace somewhat. Although you can't do a whole lot here with these chargers behind him. Carl Collis, he too stopped early. So these three leaders are in a little bit of a bind here as far as fuel is concerned against the contrast, of course, of Bob McCready, who's got a full tank. Well, you're right. McCready, he is not on any economy run. You see him going by there right now, currently in 50, trying to get around some lap traffic. Number 10, Lou Blaney, just in front of him. Well, this, of course, is a costly situation for Bob McCready because as he tries to weave his way through these slower cars, Johnson and Hearn out front have got a clear racetrack. So this may be uh, one of the things that will cost McCready down near the end of the race. He's being balked a little bit by Blaney. Hard to get by in this very narrow racetrack, and McCready is obviously falling back. Well, McCready at this stage of the game, Brock, is not going to be able to adopt that pass only in turn one uh, axiom. He's going to have to take it anywhere he can get it. Right, and these cars, as you know, all carry big block Chevys. We talked earlier about the very rigid specifications on the, on the bodywork, et cetera. Look at this. McCready tries to make that pass on Blaney. Can't make it work. The pressure builds on this man as the leaders begin to move away from him. It is Brett Hearn currently about two car lengths ahead of Jack Johnson. Remember, Johnson is going for his second consecutive victory here at Syracuse. Also remember, too, that Brett Hearn started way back in the pack. Uh, Jack Johnson way up front. And now let's go down to the pits with Steve, who's with Jojo DeSarbo, Johnson's crew chief. Well, Jojo, can you make it two in a row? We're going to try awful hard. Awful good pit stop. Very good, very good. I thought the guys did a good job on a pit stop. You know, the tires that came off look almost brand new. They were very good, exceptionally good wear on the tires this year. Now, Brett Hearn, he's not going to go down lightly here. I don't think so. What does Jack say on the radio? Anything? Uh, I want to try and get a hold of him right now. Let's listen in. Bob's halfway in the middle of the pack, and you better get a hold of Hearn right away quick here, because he's coming fast. Any answer? Yeah, he is. What do you answer? He says he say he's running. <laughs> that he is. Jack Johnson may make it two in a row. All right, look at this. Johnson tries Hearn on the outside of turn number one. That is confidence in your chassis, believe me. Couldn't make it stick, but he sure gave Hearn a little bit of a scare as they go down the back straightaway with Hearn still holding on to the lead. But it showed Steve Evans that Johnson definitely has the handling in that race car to challenge Hearn anytime he wants to. And as they battle wheel to wheel, Brock, I doubt they have any time to even think about that potential fuel problem we discussed earlier. These guys pitted early. Do they have enough gas in the tank to go the distance? And you know, JoJo wasn't kidding. Bob McCready is in the middle of the pack. The last time, there you see him, the yellow and white car. The last time we saw him, he was 15th. He's moved up to 11th. But Steve, he's got his hands full with a lot of slower traffic because we saw earlier Hearn and Johnson, nice clear racetrack. And poor old Bob, he's stuck back there with some fast cars and some slow ones as well. But in a tight, narrow racetrack like this, you can't just kind of get on the outside and wail around everybody. You have to find just a few spots to get past, and each one of those can be a very difficult pass. Remember, he fought hard to get by Lou Blaney. Now Glenn Fitzcharles, who fallen back and not running too well is in front of him and of course he too is a formidable obstacle for barefoot Bob and up front two guys who race these modified cars for a living Brad Hearn in the number 20 car the yellow and white machine a very articulate good looking driver has his sights set someday on NASCAR stock car racing behind him Jack Johnson modified racing is his life and a win here can really salvage a season you can make as much money net here Brock as you might in a whole year of racing these cars as well we know with Jack Johnson who's packed home an awful lot of money with two victories here at Syracuse already in his illustrious career from Waynesburg, New York, a small town here in upstate. 
This is a test of raw speed and handling for these two men. No other race cars in their way. Essentially a clear track, a lot of attrition here. So they've got a wide open racetrack to test each other out. It looks as if Hearn has a little bit of an advantage on the straightaways, and then Johnson tends to tuck in underneath them as they go through these very tight corners here at Syracuse. Steve is back with JoJo. Joe, Joe, I think it's almost as hard on you guys watching as it is on Jack trying to get it done. It sure is. It looks to be a real driver's battle right now. That's what it is right now. Jack, you got to get it done now. Joe, Joe, talking to Jack Johnson. You got to get it done now. The pretty's on his way. What's he asking you, Joe, Joe? He didn't ask me anything. I just told him that he had to get going here. <laughs> Fifty thousand dollars at stake. I'll say he's got to get going. And Brock, as you can hear, they're as concerned about McCready as they are about Brett Hearn. Well, they sure are, because McCready is slowly creeping up on him. As soon as he gets clear of that lap traffic back there, he is going to be a force to be reckoned with. But right now, it's Hearn holding off Jack Johnson pretty effectively. And about an eighth of a mile back, Brock, is this scrap for the third spot. Carl Collis in number 12, trying to hold off number 61, C.D. Coville. That is the race for third position. Up front, same story. Brad Hearn, Jack Johnson, just beating on each other again as he has lap after lap. Johnson goes high, tries to look around Hearn and might get him this time. No. Going into two, it's not going to happen there. He tucks back in. Brock, I can't answer that question you posed earlier. Is Brett Hearn running only as hard as he has to or flat out? You're right. Only he knows the answer to that one. I also wonder if Jack really thinks that he can get by him on the outside or if he's just trying to put a little extra pressure on him. Again, the race for third spot. It is still Carl Collins at number 12 holding off C.D. Coville. And here come the leaders again in at turn number one. This time, Brett Hearn has a little more of a cushion than he did before. So Hearn starting to step on it a little bit harder and break a little later. And there's the race for third. Those guys are closing up behind first and second. Collis still hanging in there in number 12. If Carl Collis could ever qualify up front, he would be apt to win one of these Syracuse mile races. He was way back in the field last year and finished second. Started 34 30 day and has moved up to third. Right now, Brock Yates is down in Carl Collis's pit. Brock? How about Mike Lusso is the crew chief on Carl Collis's car? And once again, a terrific run for the back, uh, Mike. But uh, he's sitting in third. He made your stop. Uh, how do things look from here on in? Well, we have some. We have a minor oil leak in the motor right now. It's affecting uh, the interior of the compartment. I think we'll be able to hold out as long as it's not a dis discomfort to him. He might be a little hurt, I think. I don't think it's too serious. But I think we're in a hunt. Uh, we'll cool it until the end. Caution laps are probably helping him, huh? Yeah, I think so. It's helping yeah. us too. How about uh, how about is he? What's he saying to you on the radio? Anything uh, about the race car or the racetrack? He says he feels uh, comfortable in it. He says uh, he's got a long way to go. That's about it, right? There. No stops. No, no, no stops. No, no, you're going to go the distance, right. presuming that you got no that oil doesn't get bad. Right. And, uh, That's our only concern right now. Well, I sure hope it stays together for you, Mike. Oh, you. Well, we'd like to see him do the same thing he did last year. Well, it was just beautiful. Yes, Thank sir. You. Thanks. Good job. Yes, sir. Well, Brock, that's just what a driver needs when he's fighting the Moody Mile, a hot oil shower inside the car. Mike Lusso getting up on the truck to cheer home Carl Collis, but up front, same deal. Brad Hearn, Jack Johnson, nothing's changed here. Neither man giving any quarter nor asking any. Right, Steve. Johnson continues to take that high line through turn one, but it's Hearn down the back straightaway. Turn three starts to get bumpy as usual here at Syracuse. Well, I'll tell you what, though, Steve, Carl Collis has got to get a break here at this particular point. He's down about uh, almost a half a lap to the two leaders, Hearn and Johnson. And unless we start to get some yellow flags here, he is not going to have much of a chance to uh, pull those guys in. And moreover, don't forget, he's got a charging Bob McCready right behind him. So Collis, with that oil leak, has got to be hoping maybe to back this pace down a little bit and uh, move up on the leaders through a caution. And Brock, the cars look to me to be a little more twitchy than they were in the early going. That's probably due to the fact the track is getting slick, it's getting rough, and tires are starting to go away. Right, Steve. Well, you heard Ed Bruce describe this place as the Moody Mile, as they call it, and that is simply because the track conditions will change throughout the course of the race. It's kind of cool, and it's kind of damp here, and who's to know what this track surface is doing as far as handling is concerned? 
Well, let's check in on the charge of Bob McCready. He's in six spot, just glued to the near far of 113. That is Tom Wilson, who's done a nice job of driving today. Very conservative, has stayed out of trouble. But right now, he has got a tiger on his tail by the name of Purefoot Bob McCready. McCready trying anything he can do to get around him. Here's the ideal place to pass, but not on this lap. McCready is still stranded in six spot. Well, he has been in the middle of it uh, as far as traffic is concerned almost from the time he made that pit stop late in the race. And so Bob McCready really has had an awful hard job of it. He just hadn't had any clear track at all. While in the meantime, Hearn and Johnson have really been able to get free of everybody. Here is our two guys out front. Notice they've got almost a full straightaway lead right now on Carl Collis. So both Brett Hearn and Jack Johnson have really got her all their own way being unchallenged and at this particular point not having any major problem with the man who is right now the quickest on the racetrack and that is Bob McCready. There goes Hearn around the outside of a slower automobile and Johnson trying to get past him. He'll probably wait until the front straightaway to move by. There they go down the fast outside line heading into turn number one and that little move there gave Hearn about a four car length advantage over Jack Johnson. And I have a feeling, Brock, that number nine, Bob McCready, would gladly right now give back the $2,000 bonus he earned for leading at the midway point to just rethink all of that strategy. Had he pitted at the same time that Hearn and Johnson did well, it might be a whole different story. Well, right now, his hands are full with uh, Wilson, who's uh, running very well up there in that fifth spot. Now, remember, Wilson is on the same lap as McCready, so he's not about to give way and let him by. As there comes Johnson, once more, he's reeled in. Hearn, once again, gets right up on his tail as they come off a of turn two. They've done that lap after lap, but notice that Hearn just tends to pull out a little bit down the back straightaway. So it's... Hearn's uh, speed on the straight right now and Johnson's ability to get through turn one and turn two that keeps this race close. Well, Johnson would like, I think, Brock, to take that same line as Brett Hearn. His car just will not handle down low. Well, Steve, notice now that Hearn seems to be moving out a little bit away from the inside rail. It may be that the groove has moved out there, and it also may be that he's trying to protect that inside or that outside line from uh, Jack Johnson. He's been trying to pass him out there. Well, Brock, Brett Hearn may have an opportunity here to put some distance between Johnson if he can use the lap traffic to his advantage. Let's see. He gets one car between them. Johnson's going to try to go high out of the marbles, get very sideways. Let's see if Johnson can lap that car as well. No. Brad Hearn did that beautifully. Johnson's car is just not handling as well. Absolutely, Steve. He uh, just doesn't seem to be able to get out of that groove as well as uh, Hearn does. Hearn can move all over the racetrack. As you saw there, he went way wide in turn three to get past that lap car. Jack tried it and fell back. So that appears to be a handicap as far as Jack's number 12A is concerned. Okay, here is Bob McCready. He is challenging Tom Wilson, or still challenging Tom Wilson, number 113 for fifth. And they are both closing in on number 61, C.D. Coville. And look at this, McCready on the outside of Wilson and underneath Coville. A double play in turn three and four for Bob McCready. And look at this, that's car number six. Fritz Epright up against the wall in turn number one, shredding that left rear tire. But you know, Brock, that is going to give Bob McCready the yellow flag he needs so desperately to make up that vast distance between Brett Hearn and Jack Johnson. Right oh, this is going to get interesting, and this is what caused it. Apright loses that left rear at probably about 150 miles an hour and really does a pretty good job under the circumstances to prevent a more serious accident. So Fritz slides to a stop. That'll bring out the tow car to clear the wreckage away. No injuries here, fortunately. But the most important result of this particular incident is the fact that barefoot Bob McCready will start out on the rear bumper of Jack Johnson. And this means that any one of four or maybe even five cars could still win the Schaefer 200. Brad Hearn leads it right now, Jack Johnson in second, but anything could happen when we come back to the richest dirt track race in the world. The pace car is off the track. We have got four cars in a royal battle for the Schaefer 200. Brad Hearn, the yellow and white car number 20, on the point. Behind him in the orange car number 12 is Jack Johnson, then Carl Callis, and now up into the fourth spot. He closed up to the leaders due to that yellow flag. Bob McCready, what a race this is going to be. The closing laps. And here comes Brad Hearn. 
as so often has been the case. He tucks in low. Jack Johnson right behind him. Look at that. Smoke coming off of the right rear tire of Johnson as he struggles for traction on this very hard Syracuse mile, Steve. Well, that tells you a couple of things. One, Jack Johnson is running as hard as he can. Number two, the racetrack is indeed getting worse and worse. But also you're seeing Johnson working an awful lot harder. Notice Brett's car is staying pretty well pointed all the way around the racetrack. Jack is sliding, oversteering a lot. The rear end is loose, and he is working hard. Here comes McCready challenging Collis for third place. Indeed he is, Brock, and if he can get around Collis, he is really going to have to stand up. You see a little smoke coming off of his tires now. So he has got some of the same problems as Jack Johnson. Well, Bob McCready was able to make that marvelous march from 15th to 4th, but now he's got one tough customer. The second place runner here a year ago, Carl Collis, is between he and Jack Johnson. He needs to get that third spot right away. Well, it's been an eventful afternoon for Bob McCready. Remember, he started on the outside of the front row. That is his crew cheering him on. Started on the outside next to Sammy Swindell, took the lead, and now challenges once more for third place. Had the lead for most of the middle stages of the race, then made a late stop, fell back to 15th, as you said, Steve Evans, and now has scratched his way back to fourth. A pair of perfectly matched automobiles and drivers up front. Brad Hearn and Jack Johnson, less than five laps to go. And still in my mind, Brock, I wonder about fuel consumption. The yellow flag may have been a break for them as far as gas mileage is concerned. Here is Brad Hearn's crew. They are trying to prey him on the victory. <laughs> and you can be sure the same thing is going on with Bob McCready and Carl Collis's crews as well because these guys are locked in a struggle for third place. As McCready right on Collis's rear nerf bar as they head into turn number three. It'll be a wonder if Collis can hold him off. McCready is charging so hard. And, of course, we know Collis has got some mechanical problems. And at this stage of this race, with the prize money at stake, you know McCready is not about giving him a little shot and knocking him out of the grip if he has to. Well, it's a courageous drive by Carl Collis no matter what with that hot oil leaking on him. McCready fighting his way back from a big handicap early in the race. So here comes Brett Hearn down the front straightaway and Johnson right on his rear wheel. Johnson's timing is perfect. He didn't dare stay wide another second or he'd have been pushed out of the marbles. He has to get back in there in that groove. Brad Hearn, Jack Johnson, a war between these two. Brad Hearn has never won this race. Johnson trying to make his three career victories. Well, Steve, you can see the differences in handling. Hearn's car is so much more stable than Jack, who's just battling that kind of uh, cranky race car around here, wants to oversteer, and he is working like a fiend out there to stay up with uh, a much smoother handling race car in the hands of Brett Hearn. And Jack Johnson keeps experimenting a little higher on the racetrack, but it will not cooperate. The Moody Mile is not going to work for Jack Johnson. They're not up high anyway, and he can't seem to get down low either. Now, he, oh, and we've got a shredded tire. That is C.D. Coville, car number 61. He was running eight. Now that, yes, it is going to bring out yet another caution flag. Now, is that an advantage for a guy like Bob McCready, Brock, so he can close up the gap? Or maybe an advantage for a Brad Hearn who can save fuel? Could work both ways. It sure could, but nonetheless, McCready has now gotten past Carl Collis and is sitting in third spot. So here comes the leader, Brad Hearn, backing it down. He'll tuck in behind the pace car and breathe a big sigh of relief, Steve Evans, because this means he can conserve some of that fuel that is obviously running very low. Yes, Brock, but that might be a mixed blessing because Bob McCready, who no question has the fastest car on the racetrack, has now moved right up behind Jack Johnson. He's in that third spot, and he could strike from there if there's enough time to go in the race. And what a shame for C.D. Colville in the pits with that exploded tire. But he can hold his head high. What a great job he's done. I'll tell you what, that crew is not done, Brock. They're going to try to rip that nerf bar out and get on out there. They sure are, Steve. They started back in 12th spot, worked their way all the way up to fourth during the middle stages of the race. C.D.'s done a super job, and he's not going to let it go to totally for naught right now. He'll get back into it. Won't finish among the leaders, though, unfortunately. Well, the green flag is coming out, so put your money down. Is it going to be number 20, Brad Hearn, all the way from the 31st spot? Or Jack Johnson, who started up front and continues to run to the second spot? Can Bob McGrady get around both of them? We're going to find out right now. It boils down to this. Three cars and a duel as they come off turn number two and down the straight, back straightaway. It's Hearn, Johnson, and McCready. Hearn seems to be able to hold on, Steve. They all seem evenly matched as far as power is concerned. It's right here. 
tight turns. We'll see the difference if any. Johnson's car. The rear end just wants to kick out a little more than he'd like. Now, all of a sudden, McCready's car is doing the same thing. Not handling as well as it was. Here we go on to the last lap. Headed down into turn number one. Here's Brad Hearn. Does he have enough fuel to go three quarters of a mile? We're going to find out. The crew just praying, just hoping that that car is going to make it work. They know he's running on fumes. He told them on the radio that he's concerned. McCready, of course, driving hard. He's got plenty of fuel as they head down into turn number three. It is still earned right behind him. Johnson and McCready making one final bid as they come out of the final straightaway. Jack Johnson goes low. One final shot. It is not enough. Brad Hearn, number 20. The youngster from New Jersey has won the Schaefer 200. And in this part of the country, Brockage, that makes you an instant legend. Right, Steve, and it's just about like winning the lottery as well, as he'll take home over $50,000. Brad Hearn has won the Schaefer 200, followed by Jack Johnson, as he was for so many laps. Bob McCready, a valiant comeback, just couldn't quite pull it up. Let's go to Brock with the winner. Incredible mob scene down there. Everybody's gone. Brad, did you run out? Did you just run out of gas? We, we just ran out of gas coming down off of turn four. You were you are worried about fuel. The crew said for quite a while. With 10 laps to go, I couldn't tell if it was running out of fuel or if we had carburetor trouble, but it started sputtering with 10 to go. Hey, fantastic effort. Beautiful. I, I can't believe it. <laughs> All right. What a show by Brad Hearn. A victory here. Okay, let's go to Steve with a second place finisher. Jack Johnson, a very tired Jack Johnson with the helmet off. I'll tell you what, there were moments there that I and your crew thought you were going to do it. And we tried every trick in the book. He was in a fast lane. I just couldn't go by him. He run a heck of a race. A case of two very evenly matched automobiles and drivers. Yeah, I would say so. I'll tell you, the race was real fast today. And uh, after all, all the bad weather early, I was uh, really surprised the track was as uh, fast as it was. Well, just to stay out of trouble today was a major accomplishment. Yeah, it sure was. There was a lot of scary moments out there today. And uh, thank God everybody came out of it all right. All right, thank you, Jack. You know, I said earlier, Brad Hearn was popular. Look at this. Up on top of this race car at the finish line. What a celebration. Okay, let's go to Brock with the third place runner, Bob McCready. A magnificent comeback, a try. I know you're disappointed. If you had it to do over again, would you have stopped earlier? Or what was the strategy in that holding on and stopping late? Well, you just gamble with racing, and we gambled, and it didn't work. So we gave it our best shot. My crew did an excellent job, and the car worked fantastic, and I made the mistake. That's the way you I drove beautifully. You're terrific. You got to be pleased with the performance. You were another 20 laps, and it might have been yours. Well, the decision to pit's up to me, and they left it up to me, and that's the only mistake made all day. So uh, that's the way it is. Sometimes it works. Well, our congratulations anyway. A super piece of work. Well, thank you very much. You just never get excuses from a true champion like Bob McCready. A final note on the condition of Buzzy Rudiman. We are told that he has suffered some serious neck injuries, but that the prognosis for a complete recovery is good. We wish Buzzy Rudiman, a veteran of 28 years, and this kind of racing, one of the most popular drivers ever in the Northeast, a speedy recovery.